The tension in the air was palpable. Everyone who sat around the long oak table was sweating in their business suits, tugging at their ties so that it might dislodge the collective lumps in everyone's throats. At the head of the table, someone sat facing away from the rest of the gathered executives, their silk-gloved hands interlocked, the crown of a top hat just visible over the back of their broad, throne-like chair. So, my friends, they said without turning around, in a voice that filled the boardroom. What a sorry state of affairs this is. The SCP Foundation sticking their noses in, sniffling around the company, shutting down factories. And then there are our customers too obsessed with Fortnite to be interested in the toys we're making. If Wondertainment Enterprises can't touch the hearts of every man, woman, and child on the planet, then what are we even doing here? What is our point? A pause lingered. Nobody in the room knew whether to answer or keep quiet and let somebody else speak first. That wasn't a rhetorical question, the voice yelled from its chair. We are a company that makes toys. That is our point, and that's why you're here, so go ahead, don't be shy. Pitch me something. After another moment of silence, one of the board members nervously stood up from his chair. Attempting to straighten his tie, he produced a box containing a prototype. Um, I might have something, Doctor, he said, nervously struggling to compose himself. Go on. Opening the box, the man produced a small circular spinning top with jagged edges, or a Beyblade, to those born after 1999. So, um, 90s nostalgia is back uh, in right now, the executive stammered, assembling the Beyblade in his shaking hands. And Wondertainment Enterprises can be the first to relaunch this popular playground craze from uh, back in the day. He pulled the ripcord, letting the spinning toy loose on the desk. Instead of spiraling in a circle, though, the Beyblade shot across the table's surface and hopped down to the floor, a tiny voice emanating from it the entire time. No, no, please don't make me fight. I can't. I won't do it. I don't want to die. It sobbed as it raced across the floor and out the door. Realizing he didn't need to say anything else, the board member sat back down. Another stood up, more eager now that somebody else had gone first. Well, we were thinking something more for the younger market, she declared. She produced a large flashcard that displayed an image of a pretty ordinary-looking hobby horse. You can't really go wrong with the classic, right? She asked, looking around the room for any looks of approval from the rest of the board. Anyway, these hobby horses are durable. They come in a range of colors. There's just, um, <clears throat> one little caveat. We got some calls from the Italian Prime Minister after we'd been testing them. Apparently at the exact same time someone rocks on one of these hobby horses, a random person in Italy just gets turned to dust. We currently have... Ah, uh, no way of counteracting this. There were a few short murmurs from the rest of the board. Sensing she was losing them, the same executive signaled her assistant, who retrieved something from outside the boardroom. As she re-entered, she was holding a teddy bear at arm's length, grimacing in disgust. The rest of the board quickly realized why. The bear carried with it a pungent stench that hung heavy in the air. Keeping with that younger market I was talking about, the exec piped up again, holding her nose shut. Kids love gross-out humor, right? You put a fart in an animated movie and the tykes go nuts for it, so this <coughs> delightful product, the Stinky Bear, can bring the same enjoyment into the home for the low price of $39.99. Are those the same bears that R&D was testing a while back? One of the other Wondertainment executives asked. The ones that had a 1 in 5 chance of releasing lethal amounts of Novichok? Wait, isn't that a Russian nerve agent? Another exclaimed in horror. Get that Stinky Bear out of here! Defeated, the presenting executive retook her seat while her assistant carried the bear to the incinerator. Well, this has been a poor show thus far, came the good doctor's voice from the far end of the table, interrupted by a tinny electronic beeping. Mr. Glenridge, what is that in your pocket? Oh, sorry, feeding time. The board member, Mr. Glenridge, apologized, pulling out a tiny oval-shaped device and, oddly enough, a candy bar. It's a Tamagotchi, you remember those, right? Well, we whipped up this one to be more intelligent, but it keeps demanding actual solid food, so I just have to, you know. Glenridge then proceeded to tear open the candy wrapper and began mushing it into the Tamagotchi's LCD screen. The virtual pet made a number of sad-sounding beeps, almost like it was crying over its own lack of taste buds. I think the problem here is obvious. A stuffier older member of the board, Mr. Omer, spoke up. Look, we all know that the dang kids are too distracted by their darn cell phones these days. 
And sure, we could sit here and try to get them interested in the anomalous entertainment we're trying to sell them. Or we could try to profit off them by going after what we know they're already obsessed with. I really don't think you should pursue this train of thought, Mr. Omer. An executive named Mix Claren interjected. No, this is a good idea, Omer protested. It's simple. We develop an app, a video game that the kids won't be able to get enough of. But here's the catch. In order to progress in that game, we can encourage them to spend real cash in exchange for some kind of uh, virtual currency that can only be used in the app. It'd be essentially worthless, useless even, anywhere other than inside our game. But if they want to be the best at it, then the kids will have to keep coughing over the dough. And hey, we could even throw in some kernel-grade spyware, too, so when they have the app on their phones, it simultaneously harvests all their personal data and... At the snap of the doctor's gloved fingers, Mr. Omer was suddenly vaporized, letting off one final shriek as he turned into a pile of ash on the table. I think Mr. Omer failed to realize that many other companies already beat us to the punch with that idea. <sighs> Dr. Wondertainment sighed, exasperated. And besides, we aren't monsters. Somebody else take the floor, please. Well, <clears throat> Mix Claren mumbled, standing up, wiping some of Mr. Omer's ash off their glasses. Our social media team has been doing some research into current online trends, and it turns out we might have something that fits with a really popular one. Claren produced a pristine doll's house, a two-scale recreation of a single-story home in Albuquerque, New Mexico. They opened up the walls, revealing a group of figurines inside, each one moving of its own accord, mimicking verbal speech with a series of little noises. Lifting off the house's plastic roof, a tiny sculpted pizza slipped off the tiles. So, we built this a while ago during the peak of the show's popularity, Claren explained. It's a doll's house. The dolls inside are somewhat alive, as you can see, but they're always acting out the plot of Breaking Bad scene by scene in broadcast order. Sure enough, one of the dolls was a miniature bald-headed Walter White, making some little squeaks that sounded like it was saying, I am the one who knocks. Breaking Bad has uh, had a major resurgence in meme culture lately, so this could be a viable product. One of the other board members chimed in. Right, exactly. Claren smiled nervously. Uh, of course, we'd have to sort out a licensing agreement with AMC, otherwise we might get sued. Returning to their seat, Claren trailed off, hoping someone else would step in to fill the latest bout of uncomfortable silence. Wiping a bead of sweat from his brow, a Mr. Ash took the floor, his assistant wheeling in a projector and hooking it up to a laptop. The rest of the executives couldn't hear the imaginary building drumroll in Ash's head as he walked up and began to play a video clip. My fellow board members, he announced with a well-rehearsed beaming smile. As interesting as some of these other pitches have been, I believe I may well have something truly special to show you. Behold, the Dr. Wondertainment Zoomatron pedal car. Through the projector, the video showed a large plastic toy car with a crash test dummy sitting in it. It gradually began building up speed at an impressive rate for an outdoor toy. The Zoomatron was whipping around an indoor testing track faster and faster until it was little more than a blur, a speeding ring of constant motion. The board could just make out the dummy's arms flailing limply thanks to the sheer G-force. I'm almost afraid to ask, Mr. Glenridge cleared his throat and spoke up, but exactly how fast does that thing go? I'm very glad you asked, Mr. Ash replied excitedly. It can reach up to Mach 6 with just an average amount of pedals per second, or PPS if you will. But surely that's dangerous, Mix Claren queried. I mean, an object of that size moving six times the speed of sound that low to the ground? I won't deny there have been a few, um, <clears throat> let's call them teething problems, Ash admitted. Almost on cue, the video showed a Wondertainment Enterprises worker stepping accidentally into the path of the speeding pedal car, only to vanish in a split second as it whizzed by. The car shot into, and then through, a nearby wall. You have anything else, Mr. Ash? Dr. Wondertainment asked impatiently from their chair. I, um, <clears throat> well, I, he stammered, rummaging through some papers. Um, in a similar vein, we also developed an electric scooter. You know, the, like those bird ones you see people riding around on a lot. Doesn't go quite as fast as the Zoomatron, so that could potentially be safer. Marginally. I meant to say marginally safer. What's the catch with this one? The board member asked, their exasperation obvious in their tone. It's probably better if I just show you. Mr. Ash sighed. He pressed play on another testing clip, wherein a Wondertainment employee stood atop their scooter. At first, it seemed to be moving normally. That is, until the camera filming had zoomed out. The employee and the scooter were floating several feet in the air. We're, uh, 
We're still waiting for that staff member to return from their journey, he said sheepishly. I'll just sit back down. What if we made a yo-yo out of lasagna? Mr. Glenridge asked. The rest of the board all turned to look at him confused, before he receded in his chair out of embarrassment, fiddling with his starving Tamagotchi in the hopes that the next outlandish toy idea would make everyone forget what he had just said. Luckily enough, one of the execs, Miss Stevenson, opened up her briefcase and produced a brightly colored stuffed bear. If I might bring us back to basics, she announced, or bear six, if you pardon the pun, we won't, Dr. Wondertainment said bluntly. Oh, well, um, allow me to introduce the doesn't care bear. Stevenson forced a smile, then handed the bear to the nearest board member. What am I supposed to do with this? Mr. Ash asked, confused. Just press the stomach, Miss Stevenson urged, giving him a wide-eyed glare as if to say either work with me here or please help. Doing as instructed, Ash gave the doesn't care bear a gentle squeeze, activating a voice box somewhere inside it. Wow, Marlin, your surgeon really conned you for those hair plugs, the bear sneered cruelly. Mr. Ash instinctively reached up to his forehead, where his hairline had been noticeably receding until only a few months ago, but he'd never told anyone about his transplant. In truth, it was something he felt pretty insecure about. I, I don't know what it meant by that, Mr. Ash protested, playing it off with a half-hearted chuckle. Darn thing must be defective. Not as defective as your scalp, Marlin! The bear gave another callous jeer. Did you seriously think that looked realistic? Nobody's hairline is that ruler straight, not naturally anyway. Maybe if you've been a baker like your dad wanted you to, you could have avoided all the stress that made you lose your hair in the first place. Then again, you were never that good of a son to him anyway. How in the hell do you turn this awful thing off? Mr. Ash asked frantically, holding back tears. Isn't it great? Miss Stevenson said, forcing a toothy grin. Imagine how great it would be for boosting kids' confidence. By... Honing in on their worst insecurities? Mix Claren raised an eyebrow. Presenting them with something they don't like about themselves will challenge them to improve on it, Stevenson argued in an unjustly condescending voice. That's just basic reverse psychology. Deborah taking a one-day course doesn't make you a clinical psychiatrist, the Dozen Care Bear retorted. You know, you really aren't as smart as you want people to think you are. How about a modern update of an old classic? Mr. Jeffries, an older executive, spoke up excitedly setting up something on the table in front of him. It was a pair of foldable playing boards, with a collection of tiny ships, each one a different size and shape. Mix Claren, if you'd be so kind, he said, passing them one half of the board game. That's just Battleship, Stevenson retorted, stuffing the abrasive bear back into her briefcase. Ah, but wait, Mr. Jeffries replied jovially, finished placing his miniature boats. Now then, give me a coordinate. Ah. Uh, B6? Clarence said. Direct hit! Jeffries clapped his hands excitedly. It was then that everyone noticed a tiny streak of smoke shooting up from one of the ships on Clarence's board. Glowing, it soared directly upwards, leaving a trail behind it, climbing through the air over the table. Then, once it was above Mr. Jeffries' board, the little glowing projectile began to plummet straight back down. At once, the board members all realized it was a miniature missile, some of them urgently ducking under their desks before it struck its target. A small explosion erupted on Mr. Jeffrey's board, punctuated by a miniature fireball and cloud of black smoke that wafted up only to be sucked into the boardroom's air purifier. From the battleship that had just been hit with shrunken ordnance, the Wondertainment execs could hear some tiny, barely audible voices. They were screaming and shouting in a state of panic, Mayday, Mayday, and Abandoned Ship, Swim for Your Lives were the only words anyone could clearly decipher. Battleship Extreme Edition! Mr. Jeffries announced proudly with a chuckle, met with looks of concern from the board members brave enough to sit back down in their chairs. While we're on the topic of games, Mix Clarence spoke up again, I did have this. They produced a handheld video game player, the kind that only featured one classic title. Fortunately, the particular title was Pac-Man, the distinctive music and flapping sound of the titular character's mouth instantly recognizable even to the youngest members of the Wondertainment Enterprises board. Come on, Kay, one of the executives sighed. We're all waiting to hear the catch. Ah, uh, it's, um, <clears throat> this one's actually pretty horrible, they admitted, handing the game across the table to Mr. Glenridge. Seemingly happy to be free from the Tamagotchi's pleas for food, he began absentmindedly playing Pac-Man. I mean, it handles well, he observed, guiding the yellow mouth flapping icon around the maze, avoiding multicolored ghosts as he chomped down on any dots in his path. It's quite a throwback, too. 80s nostalgia is still hot right now, isn't it? Ooh, power capsule! 
Mr. Glenridge hit the corresponding buttons to lead Pac-Man towards the larger dot, which granted him a power-up ability to eat the ghosts that were patrolling the maze. Tapping away with both thumbs, he got Pac-Man to follow in the path of one of the ghosts. Then the handheld game started screaming. Billy! Billy, please, no! shrieked a tinny 8-bit voice. Ma? Mr. Glenridge's face went pale, drained of all color as he stared horrified at the game in his hands. Pac-Man kept following the path of the fleeing ghost, gaining on it. The closer he got, the louder the compressed screaming got. Billy, stop! Don't let him eat me, please, son! But sure enough, Pac-Man caught up with the ghost and kept up his perpetual chomping. As the ghost was eaten in the game, the built-in speaker played the blood-curdling cries of Mr. Glenridge's mother over the classic theme music. Silently, with a look of pure shock on his face, Glenridge put the game down on the desk. So, yeah, there's that, Clarence said awkwardly. A Pac-Man game with the souls of dead relatives trapped inside. These toys are all... Well, perfectly useless, let's be honest, the good doctor erupted. Are you forgetting we have the SCP Foundation breathing down our necks? Surely any one of these abominations would have them poking around and investigating us even more. How about this? One of the execs interrupted. Picture Monopoly, but Site-19 edition. We could really get our own back on the Foundation. Expose where the anomalies are kept. Just generally cause some trouble for them. Oh, the plane pieces could be some of the things they have in containment. Another joined in. Instead of the shoe, the car, and the iron, we might have an anomalous shoe, car, and iron. And being sent to jail in the game would turn a player into a member of their D-Class personnel. The first board member replied, ENOUGH! The doctor's booming voice silenced the whole room. That is, without a doubt, one of the most absurdly stupid ideas I have heard in the history of this company! With respect, somebody spoke up. I think you're all overthinking this. One of the board members who had been sat at the furthest end of the table, keeping quiet throughout the rest of the farcical presentations, suddenly stood up. Adjusting his tie, he addressed his fellow Wondertainment executives. Doctor, you'd like our, apologies, your company to uphold its core purpose to make toys and reach people all over the globe, he stated. And as a healthy added bonus, you'd like to stick it to those killjoys over at the SCP Foundation too. So why don't we do something that will cover all those bases? That's what we've all been trying to do, Glenridge protested. Like I said, you're overthinking it, the exec replied. Let me show you something. Casually, he produced a stylized plush. The group leaned in, astonished to see it resembled SCP-049, better known as the Plague Doctor. We make plushies. The board member paused for dramatic effect of the Foundation's SCPs. Very intriguing, Dr. Wondertainment declared, finally turning their chair around to face forward, examining the Plague Doctor plush in their gloved hand. Anyone who types scpswag.com into their search engine of choice will find high-quality plushies of some of the SCP Foundation's most beloved anomalies. There was a tortuous pause. The members of the boardroom could barely breathe as Dr. Wondertainment rose to his feet and began to clap. You son of a bitch. I'm in. Now go and check out SCP-001 A Simple Toy Maker, my favorite episode and all the little misters explained for more of the wondrous world of Dr. Wondertainment.